So the St. Alphonsus de Liguori was born in 1696 in Naples, Italy. The, and he grew up as a, he was intended to become a lawyer, which he did. He lost a certain case and he, he said, world, I know you now. And he realized that the judge had been bribed, which it turned out that the judge had been bribed by a cardinal of the church, no, no less. The cardinal had bribed the judge with a pair of dancing bears. And so the the uh, the the, uh, the the case went to the opposing uh, the 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 other the the other uh, lawyer on his side, and so Saint Alphonsus realized that something had really miscarried in justice. He said, "You know, I'm n nothing to do with this anymore." So he left the law immediately, decided to become a priest then and there, and. Uh, then in 19, sorry, in 1731, there was a series of revelations to the first Redemptoristine nun, who had been an ex-Carmelite. The king of Naples had shut down the Carmel, and uh, and our, then God the Father began giving these these revelations to Blessed Marie Celeste Croce de Rosa, saying, "I want this this convent of nuns founded that will be able to perpetuate my life in the world as a life of the Redeemer uh, through prayer and it was it, and prayer and sacrifice. It was completely contemplative. These are the Redemptoristine nuns. So Saint Alphonsus helped to start the Redemptoristine nuns with Blessed Marie Celeste. The following year, then there was another series of revelations where our Lord says, "I want." the Redemptorist Fathers now. So in seven, on November the 9th, 1732, then St. Alphonsus founded the Redemptorist Fathers in Scala in, uh, in southern Italy, in, in the kingdom of Naples. And the whole idea behind the Redemptorists was the, what the, the plan, God's plan behind this, he said, was to, for these priests to go out to help what he called the most abandoned souls, people who did not have access to spiritual helps. So in that time, in that place, in Naples, Italy, it was the shepherds who lived out in the mountainsides. There were no churches out there. There might be little wayside chapels or something. And so the Redemptress would go on horseback into the mountains and open up these wayside chapels, etc., bring about, bring in the shepherds, teach them their catechism, help them to make a good confession, give them the means necessary to persevere in God's grace for the future. And that was the beginning of the Redemptress. And that continued on. St. Alphonsus lived until uh, 1787 uh, when he died. And from then, the Redemptress began to spread. Uh, it was just at the end of the life of St. Alphonsus that St. Clement Hofbauer came out outside of Italy. He came from Germany. He was Moravian himself. He came to Rome and almost by accident, it was really by providence, of course, came to the Redemptorist Church there. And there was this little boy uh, who came up to him and said, you're going to become a Redemptorist. Of course, St. Clement afterwards said, well, that was the infant Jesus. He realized that afterwards. And sure enough, St. Clement did become a Redemptorist there in Rome, and that he was sent, he was the first Redemptorist to be sent out of Italy to Northern Europe. And so that's why all of the Redemptorist houses outside of Europe, you know, here in the United States, etc., they all have descendancy from St. Clement back to St. Alphonsus, actually. There's this, there's this lineage that that, that we have, and this, we can trace our history back to, to our founder that way. And St. Saint, Saint Clement then spread, he went back to Poland and spread and ultimately ended up in Vienna. He's known as the, as the, the apostle of Vienna in Austria. And uh, from there, then the Redemptress finally came to the United States 100 years after the founding in 1732. So it was in 1832. The Redemptress came to the United States. There were only six. There were only six that were sent over here. And uh, they suffered incredibly, in fact. Uh, and also because of the, because of the ways and, and times and places, uh, America being a very, you know, at that time backwater, complete backwater, in term, in ecclesiastically. I mean, it was you know, com total missionary area. The bishops insisted that redemptorists would not simply be monks 
in in a monastery, you know, religious, live with our vows. But um, but they said you have to run parishes and schools for us to help us out. So Pius the Ninth allowed this in the United States because originally our original rule of Saint Alphonsus forbids us to run parishes and schools. We're only allowed to do parish missions and uh, missions and retreats is what we were founded to preach. Act we were we, were, we are preaching monks, and so in the United States it was allowed by Pius the Ninth to have parishes and schools. And so from, from that time, 1832, up th through the 20th century, here in the United States, the, the most abandoned souls that the Redemptors would go to were mainly, at the beginning, it was the, the European immigrants who did not speak English in the, er, in those, in the eight, early 1800s. Uh, th so they would walk into a Catholic church and it was, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to understand the sermons. So you had all of these, these European Redemptors coming over who spoke all sorts of Slavic, Germanic, uh, romance languages who would be able to preach to the people in their own languages, hear their confessions, again, set them on the right path towards salvation. And then after a couple generations and you know the grandkids started speaking English, etc., that sort of fell out of necessity, therefore. Now, of course, since Vatican II, of course, Everyone's an abandoned soul. And so, and so we simply will preach to whoever, whoever will listen to us. So, but that's the, the, whole, the whole thrust of the Redemptress, then, is this preaching vocation. We are semi-contemplatives. We are meant to be living in our monastery. As St. Alphonsus in our rule says, normally half the year we're in our monastery, and then half the year out praying. Sorry, out preaching. And so during the time in the monastery, we have a whole schedule throughout the day of mental prayer. So there's three, three half hours of mental prayer, visits to the Blessed Sacrament, other prayers, etc., in common and also in private, etc. So, it, and then there's plenty of time also for the for the priests to be able to prepare sermons, study moral theology, particularly, etc. So that's that's our focus on on the confessional practice, etc. Saint Alphonsus being the 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 doctor of moral theology, and and then for the lay brothers, their job is to provide for the, the material welfare of the house so that it runs smoothly so that the priests can do the spiritual duties. Mm -hmm. That's in the house. Then once you get outside the house on the preaching, then the two things that we do, preaching parish missions and retreats. With regards to the parish missions, then it's going out to the parishes. Back in the old days, it would usually be the bishop who would call us out to go to each of the parishes in his diocese. Now, of course, when I'm helping out the society, it's an individual pastor will ask me and then I arrange the, the schedule from there so it's a what is a parish mission parish mission is a series of sermons and sermons on the four last things and also instructions especially on the commandments so that people know how to make a good confession Saint Alphonsus he has a whole a whole part of our rule dedicated to the, the, the exercises of the mission. And he says that the idea is that you want to be able to, to move, yet he, sa he says, start off getting the, getting the people interested. So actually appealing to the imagination, appealing to the emotions, so that it will move their will to want to know what they have to do to change their life to serve God more. So there's a whole, there's a whole psychology behind the redemptorist style of preaching, actually. And it makes sense when you actually read what he says there. And so that's how it works. You've got the, what are called the great sermons, which are usually theatrical, sort of rather dramatic. They've got big stories and all sorts of exciting things. That's what people remember. They remember the, you know, the, the, the sort of, the, this, it's a different kind of preaching. You know, parish mission preaching, there's different, you've got, you've got homiletic preaching, you've got, you've got catechetical preaching, then you have what's called parish mission style. And it's a style unto itself, actually, which is dramatic, it is theatrical, and it's meant to grab the imagination, grab the, grab the emotions, to get the will to want to do the right thing. And because once you've actually got people who want to make a good confession, it's like, boom, there you've got the God's grace. Once they can set sin behind them, then they are actually ready to say, what do I need to do to change my life? And then you're able to set them on the right road.
That's what parish missions are. That's, the, that's their usefulness in the church. Because, unfortunately, we would love everyone to be able to get on, on retreats, obviously. That's, that, that would be the ideal way. I make the comparison that parish missions are like a canvas, and you are putting the primer on the canvas, uh, you don't have time during a parish mission to do all the, the fine artwork. It's, it's, you, you're just putting the primer on, that's it. Whereas with a retreat, you actually can dig into the soul deeper to know where is God bringing this soul from? Where is God leading this soul to? What can I do to help this soul reach the end that God wants for it? And that's why, the, the, as opposed to the, the primer, this is sort of like the delicate artwork. You know, you have to be very careful with the retreat. The retreat master has to be very careful in terms of what kind of strokes does he use on the painting? Because, you know, even one sort of splotch is gonna is gonna completely mess up that soul. Actually, you've got to be very very careful of how God is trying to act in that soul. So that's sort of the difference between a parish mission and a retreat. So in the year 1988, Archbishop Lefebvre helped start a foundation of traditional redemptress in England, and eventually we moved through France and ultimately up to the Orkney Isles. And again, his idea was so that the, these traditional redemptress who would be saying only the traditional mass, obviously, and who would be keeping the original rule of St. Alphonsus, that we would be able to live, continue to live our redemptress life uh, without hindrance from the modernists and without having to worry about our future. We'd be able to help out the society of St. Pius X. So here we are 34 years later, and I'm the only redemptorist right now here in the United States. We've got others over in Europe also who help out the society as well. And we are continuing to live that vocation of ours. It's thanks to the, to the auspices of the society and thanks to that generosity of Archbishop Lefebvre in the first place back in 1988. And we want to continue on that, that, that relationship of, of helping out the society uh, because our vocation is different. The redemptorist vocation is, if you want, if you want, in a certain sense, the redemptorist vocation lays, lies halfway between the society and, let's say, the Benedictines, perhaps. So the society, very active, running parishes, running schools, etc. Benedictines being very contemplative and also a lot of manual work. Whereas the redemptors are in between this, this semi-contemplative life of preachers. And that's what our, our role is now: is going out to the society chapels when we're called on in order to be able to preach there. Mm -hmm. How many uh, redemptress are there? At the moment, I'm the only redemptress here in the United States. There's one other priest who helps out. This is a society chapel over in Britain. We have three lay brothers over there also, and we're also looking towards the future, which will eventually be, uh, God will make, make that known in his own time.